Good evening. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here to the William G. McGowan Theater at the National Archives for the next installment in our continuing celebration of the 150th anniversary of the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, and a special welcome to our C-SPAN friends tonight. Tonight, our panel of historians will dis discuss Professor James Oak's work, Freedom National, The Destruction of Slavery in the United States. We're pleased to present this program in partnership with the National Archives, Afro-American History Society, and thank them for their support. We also thank the Foundation for the National Archives, as well as the host committee for the National Archives 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. Before we begin, I'd like to alert you to two upcoming programs also connected to our celebration. Next Wednesday, January 30th, we'll host a panel discussion on Lincoln, the Emancipation Proclamation, its meaning to newly freed slaves, and its legacy. The program will begin at noon here in the theater and is presented by the National Archives Afro-American History Society. And on Thursday, February 7th at 7 p.m., we'll explore the Emancipation Proclamation in art and documents in a discussion inspired by the Smithsonian American Art Museum's exhibit, The Civil War in American Art. <laughs> to learn more about these and all of our programs, consult our monthly calendar of events. There are copies in the lobby as well as a sign-up sheet where you can receive it by regular mail or email. And you'll also find brochures about other archives events. And another way to get more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the Foundation for the National Archives. The Foundation supports the work of the agency, especially its education and outreach activities, and there are applications for membership in the lobby. And as I've said before, no one in the history of the National Archives has been refused for membership in the Foundation <laughs> for the National Archives. And there are many members of the board of the Foundation here, so it's, a, it's nice to have you all with us. Over the New Year's weekend, 9,100 people visited this building to view the original Emancipation Proclamation. Some stood in line for hours for the chance to read the words declaring that slaves and states in rebellion shall be then, thenceforth, and forever free, and to see Abraham Lincoln's signature. Although the Emancipation Proclamation did not end slavery in America, it fundamentally changed the character of the war. Overnight, a war to preserve the Union became a war for human liberation. For the nearly four million slaves held in bondage, it was a symbol of hope. That hope of freedom was finally realized in the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which abolished slavery any place under US jurisdiction. These two landmark documents of freedom reside here at the National Archives. But our shelves are filled with documents that tell the story of emancipation on the individual letter, level. A letter from a black soldier to his still enslaved wife assures her that though the present national difficulties are great, yet I look forward to a brighter day. An enslaved woman asked President Lincoln if she were free following the Emancipation Proclamation. Sadly, the answer was no, because she lived in Maryland, a border state unaffected by the decree. First person accounts of former slaves that appear in some military pension files provide a window onto the world before and after the war. Some talk of choosing a name to bear as a free person and others describe long searches to reunite their families. Milestones long denied to an enslaved population, marriage, going to school, owning land, now become possible for freed people. And our tremendous holdings of Freedmen's Bureau records contain stories of their struggles and achievements. The historians on the panel have combed these records and more here and at other research institutions in their own investigations. We're delighted to have them with us tonight. Leading the discussion tonight is Annette Gordon-Reed, a Pulitzer Prize winner and professor of American legal history at Harvard Law School, professor of history at Harvard University, and professor at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies. Joining her are James McPherson, Pulitzer Prize winning historian and professor emeritus at Princeton University, Edward Ayers, Civil War historian, author, and president of the University of Richmond, Eric Foner, historian, author, and professor of history at Columbia University, and James Oakes, professor of history at City University of New York and the author of Freedom National, the topic of tonight's discussion. A book which was researched at the New York Public Library at the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers when I was 
the director of libraries at the New York Public Library. Yeah. All the panelists will sign books in the theater lobby after the program. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Good evening. It's glad to, I'm glad to see all of you here, a wonderful audience. We're going to have a conversation, we hope, spend a, about an hour discussing amongst ourselves what with you listening, and then we will take questions from the audience. So I hope, and I'm sure you have a lot of them, and I hope you will be, not be shy about asking them. I want to start out first with Jim and asking you a question about the book, about the title of the book, and some terms you use that people may not understand. Freedom National, if you want. It, it comes from a speech that Charles Sumner gave, uh, his inaugural speech as, uh, as a U.S. Senator. The speech was called Freedom National Slavery Sectional. And it refers to two things. So the first is that it's a constitutional doctrine that political abolitionists and anti-slavery politicians had formulated by which they could, uh, in which they claimed that the Constitution made slavery strictly a local state institution, but that everywhere the Constitution was sovereign, freedom was to be the policy of the United States. So, the, so it's a constitutional document that said uh, on the high seas, in Washington, D.C., in the Western territories, freedom should be the policy of the national government. And second, it meant logically, a, a series of policies that the federal government could undertake in order to make freedom national and slavery sectional, thereby putting slavery, hopefully, on what Lincoln called the course of ultimate extinction. Mm -hmm. And it was important for you. Why was it? When did you decide that you were going to use that as your title? What, what was the moment you thought that this is the thing that was going to convey what you wanted most wanted to know about the, wanted people to know about this era and this time? Well, it 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 was the discovery that uh, we tend to write about emancipation as something that starts entirely with the war, and it was the discovery that the Republicans came into the war with a set of policies they intended to pursue to make freedom national based on this uh, very controversial doctrine of what they believe the Constitution did and did not allow. So uh, uh, my book is mostly about the origins and evolution of anti-slavery policy during the war, and I discovered that there are more antebellum origins, pre-Civil War origins, than I had anticipated. And Freedom National captures the organizing framework for anti-slavery politicians. So you think this is against the consensus, the conventional wisdom about the emancipation story? Is it you're out to overturn something? Or have people have a different view about it, let's put it that well, way? Well, to the extent that uh, there are, uh, to the extent that people argue that the, that the Republicans come into the war uh, denying any intention of interfering with slavery uh, and that as a consequence, uh, maybe emancipation was an accident, it was inadvertent, it was something nobody intended to happen. To that extent, to their, and there are historians who make that claim, I am up against them, yes. Mm -hmm. um, Ed, Ed, why do you think, because this is a, obviously an, an issue that isn't just in the past, it's here now and people are arguing about it. Why is it important to say that Lincoln and that the Republicans sort of came to this later on and that this wasn't? A part of the, the yeah, original I've had story. A, a lot of discussions over the last four years with people, and I don't. I think in, in most audiences, there's somebody who wants to resist that idea, um, and a lot of skepticism about. Frankly, well, I spoke at a, a school in uh, New York yesterday, and one young African American man said, "Isn't it true we just needed a white hero, and that they just hang that story mm -hmm. on him because it couldn't really address the fact that you know slaves basically." forced this upon him and so forth. So I find that uh, that even though Lincoln is venerated uh, in so many quarters, there's also a lot of deep skepticism. I was going to ask you about that. He's There's a lot of rehabilitating of him that <laughs> would have to be done. There are a lot of people who really have problems with him, not just the Confederates. Uh, no, well, the I, again, again <laughs> talking to the, the, these high school, and they had pretty focused uh, problems with him. Uh, but talking to these high school kids yesterday, they point to all the anomalies 
uh, you know, well, if he believed that, why is he still talking about colonization so late? You know, if he, if he believed that, you know, why didn't he have a plan for reconstruction? If he didn't believe that, why is he still writing that letter to Horace Greeley mm -hmm. and all that? So I think that uh, Jim's right, that there is a, even though people recognize that Lincoln is somehow responsible, people are just, uh, and maybe some projection of today's cynicism, Mm -hmm. of thinking, well, he can't really have guided us through all that. It must have been sort of controlling him to some extent. So I think there's a folk knowledge mm -hmm. that Lincoln was really racist mm -hmm. and that, therefore, we can't really give him all the credit. And then there's a scholarly knowledge who knows about all these other kinds of countervailing evidence mm -hmm. that suggests that uh, Jim finds the thread that ties this all together. They're all focused on the knots mm -hmm. <laughs> of contradictory evidence. And sp specifically about the Republicans, we can come back to that. What, at what point do they begin to develop a plan about this? So you, you get some sense that there's consensus that they really are going to go after slavery. Yeah. I, uh, it's pretty clear to me. Well, I, I backed into this. I, I, I started the usual place that most historians start the story of emancipation with Fortress Monroe. Mm -hmm. And then I went on to the first Confiscation Act, and I was trying to figure out uh, most of the historians write about the first confiscation act and say it didn't do anything. And then I decided, well, why did they bother passing it? What was it all about? And I discovered that they were all talking about emancipation. It was understood to be an emancipation law. And, and I saw there was a full-scale debate on emancipation. In this, this is the summer of 1861, the first summer of the war. Congress is called into a special session five months ahead of schedule, and they pass this law that begins emancipation. And two days after they passed the law, of the, well, Lincoln signs it on the 6th, and two days later, the War Department issues the instructions to begin emancipating. So, well, they couldn't have thought this up right away. I went back and looked, and sure enough, all during the secession crisis, the Republicans are saying, you know, you leave the Union, we're going to start emancipating slaves. And then I said, where did that come from? And I just kept backing up, and I ended up all the way in the 18th century, saying, where these ideas come from? <laughs> and like that, it really is a know, grand old party. <laughs> But uh, it's, it's uh, one of the things I, I understand, I actually, uh, I understand the re resistance about Lincoln because I do think people have a hard time coming to any reasonable arguments about Lincoln. The, you, 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 the tendency to turn him into a great emancipator has the counter tendency of turning him into this you know, racist, reluctant emancipator. And it's very hard to find a middle ground within which he... Uh, which, which to place him historically. And I think w one of the things I try to do in the book is just say, look, he's a Republican, and the Republicans have these ideas about what they can and can't do. They implement them very quickly, quicker than I expected them to begin emancipating, the, to, to, to implementing them. And they learn over the course of the next several years that this wasn't enough, they're going to have to go further, this is not working in the border states, we're going to have to shift our you know, policy there. And ultimately, they end up where you know uh, they realize by late 1863, early 1864, that none of these policies are actually enough, and they shift to a, a completely different policy that no one actually imagined before the Civil War, which is the 13th Amendment uh, to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's about the evolution of a policy by a party, not Lincoln as the great emancipator. Not, not an evolution of a Lincoln? Well, he's part of the evolution. The he's whole party is changing. <laughs> that is, they're, they're responding to the limits of their own policies as they're implementing them, mm -hmm, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you start off with a, at a conventional place, and then you feel you have to keep going back in the stories and pushing it back. Can, do you have any idea why other people didn't push back? But that far? You yeah. Know, I, mean, I mean, why, why is it just, why are oh, you coming well, to the point that? I, d I don't because really you have know. A, I've thought, you know, why didn't we know this? I've been. You know, I mean, surely it must have occurred to you to yes. ask this question. Yes. Oh, yes, it does. <laughs> but I don't like that question. <laughs> That's, well. I don't want to get into fights with other historians. But uh, I, I, I think there's a lot of different reasons why it became difficult. It has to do with, among professional historians, you know, there's a, the field split between political historians and social historians, and they all say different things that they don't exactly talk to one another and mm -hmm. things like that. So, you know, among Lincoln historians, you know, there are Lincoln scholars who say that Lincoln knew from the time he was a young man that he was destined to free all the slaves with the stroke of his pen. You know, so they believe there's origins, you know, uh -huh. but not the way I do. Uh, but I know, guess, so. what, what, is there anything politically at stake in not pushing things back, aside from professional 
you know, quirks or whatever. I mean, what what's at stake here? The resistance to yeah. the idea that there are, I don't, that I really don't know. It's too complicated, it's too much. I mean, do you have some idea? Do I, no, I just, I just want, as you're writing this, well, I'm, I'm just, writing you're going this, through this, I as can you're think going of through this, this and you're saying to yourself, my gosh, you know, look at yeah. this. this yeah, these this people were gonna from? do this right. all along. Right. And you think, why hasn't anybody seen this? When right. you're in that moment, right. and you discover something. Right, right. Well, I think I, I, it, start, I, I, it started in the 60s, you got a cynicism about what politics could do. And, uh, and I, I think up until the 60s and 70s, people did see this. Mm -hmm. I think there was a body of scholarship in, uh, after World War II that talked about the anti-slavery origins of the Civil War and did trace it back, mm -hmm. although not back all the way to the 18th century. And I think, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the scholarship got cynical about mm -hmm. politics. Uh, after the 60s, I think, and, mm -hmm. and, and people began to take a legitimate interest in the way social movements uh, affect politics and became focused on the abolitionist movement as the source, and then people started writing history from the bottom up and became focused on the way slaves participated in the process of emancipation, and the Lincoln scholars went off on their own and stuff like that, and they never really talked to one another, and I think some of it is just the fragmentation of professional scholarship in, mm -hmm. the, in the last decade. So mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I just decided uh, you need to put social history and political history and movement history together. Yeah. And if you do, you see, a, you see it and looks a little And that's what you thing. think your book is, your book is, is doing that. I tried to do that. that. I tried to do that. I tried to avoid this question of, of figuring out who was the person responsible for freeing the slaves or what, who was the <laughs> agent of emancipation and just say, how did it happen? Mm -hmm. I don't want to ask who freed the slaves. So how did it happen? What's mm -hmm. the process by which it happened? Mm -hmm. so. so back to the proclamation. Well, if, does anybody else want to jump in? Have any thoughts about this the fragmentation of the the field? I'll push a little bit. Uh, You'll push though, a bit. I, I really, I, 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 I'm right. talking before my two distinguished colleagues have had a chance. I'm not really like that. Um, <laughs> so, so I will make it up later yeah. in some way. I'm so shy. Yeah, I am. But uh, Jim, I was just wanting you know you you, you say that they sort of knew what they were about all along. I'm curious why Frederick Douglass didn't see what the Republican Party was about all along, since he really held it at great distance in 1860. And so if it was apparent to the Republicans, why wouldn't it be apparent to the man who was doing so much to actually lead the end of slavery? Well, first I'd question the premise of your question. Okay. I don't think he was as distant from the Republicans in 1860 as, okay. uh, as all that. And, and second, um, more than I realized, uh, for those of you who don't know, I, the, my previous book was about Frederick Douglass, so. Uh, it shows what uh, ill-advised debating more, tactic this was. <laughs> 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 it's probably evident to everybody. Now, <laughs> Ed, as you know. <laughs> from my uh, book. <laughs> more than I thought realized when I wrote that book, uh, I, I realized the, the particular position he occupies in a constitutional debate. That is, he had shifted in the 1850s I'm to sorry, a particular, Frederick right. Douglass, right. to a view of the Constitution that very few abolitionists actually believed, which was, and very few historians actually. He believed that the Constitution was an anti-slavery document, that it entitled the federal government not a, and, and create, create a moral obligation on the part of the federal government to immediately go into the southern states and begin abolishing slavery. The Republicans don't believe that, and almost no abolitionists believe that, almost nobody believes that. And he acknowledges by the late 50s that hardly anybody believes that. But a lot of it is that. A lot of it is driven by his sense that what is holding you back? Why are you resisting when the Constitution is an anti-slavery document and empowers you to do more than you're doing? So some of it is that. Some of it also, I think, is that's the position reformers are supposed to take. They're supposed to push. They're supposed to push, and they need to push. And I, I think he's pushing all along, knowing he's not going to bother pushing against the Democrats, because they're not going to move on emancipation. He only pushes against Republicans because the Republicans are movable in ways that Democrats aren't. So, so was Lincoln a reluctant emancipationist? Was he reluctant? Well, I to think take he was stance? a Republican, and the Republicans have a policy, and he goes along with the policy. I don't think they're reluctant. They're, they're talking about destroying slavery all through the secession crisis. And mm -hmm. he 
he goes along with it. I mean, for the, the famous incident at Fortress Monroe with Benjamin Butler in late May of 1860, it goes right up to the cabinet, and within a few days, the cabinet immediately approves the decision by uh, not to return slaves to their owners. That's mm -hmm. widely understood to be the first step. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Congress passes this uh, First Confiscation Act, Section 4 of which emancipates all slaves used in the rebellion. He signs it right away, and he implements it two days later. So mm -hmm. I, I think the reluctance argument is as mistaken as the great emancipator argument. Mm -hmm. I think we're looking for someone outside. I th sometimes I wonder if it's this become particularly true. I'd hate to be the person who raises the movie. but. It's particularly, like, it's like, particularly it. a problem nowadays where we live in a world of an imperial presidency and we're looking back, looking for an imperial president. And I don't think it worked that way back then. I don't think, you know, it's, it's, we, we want him to do things that it would have been inconceivable uh, mm -hmm. for a president to do in the mm -hmm. middle of the 19th century. So he's, he's a Republican. Republicans have this policy. He goes along with the policy. They pass the law. He signs the law. He implements the law. You know, and, and uh, I don't see reluctance, and I don't see him freeing all the slaves with the stroke of his pen either. Eric, could you talk a bit about Lincoln's evolution? I, I discussed this before, raised it with the Republicans, but about as a man, as, a, as an individual. Well, you know, Lincoln, uh, I think, once said that he had always hated slavery as far back as he could remember, and I don't think there's any reason to doubt that. But, um, you know, before the Civil War, the first thing we have to remember as people looking at that period is nobody knew the Civil War was coming, right? Mm -hmm. We know, we look back, it all seems so inevitable and so clear, but nobody in the 1850s knew there was going to be a Civil War or that slavery was going to be dead within a few years. People, and you know, Jim explains this very well in his book, people like Lincoln who hated slavery were, but were working within the political system and the constitutional system, unlike a Frederick Douglass who's really outside of it, um, what can they do about slavery? Even with this freedom national idea, which, as Jim writes about, there's really nothing the federal government can do about slavery in the states where it exists. It's created by state law. The federal government can't go into Mississippi and say, hey, we're going to abolish slavery here. So they talk about the periphery, various things, but that's, you know. Now, Lincoln and most Republicans said, well, we are looking forward to some end to slavery sometime in the future, very vague and uh, imprecise. So Lincoln in the 1850s is basically talks about a plan for getting rid of slavery, which he actually inherits from Henry Clay, his political idol, which is premised on states abolishing slavery. How do you encourage states to do that? Well, you say, we'll give you money for your slaves, their property. We, you can do it very gradually over a long period of time. And Lincoln says, and many others, we will encourage these free Negroes to leave the country because you don't want a gigantic population of free blacks. We know that. So they'll go to Africa. Or they'll go to Central, uh, Central America or something. Um, and so that's a plan. It, it's not a plan that any southern state ever accepts. And Lincoln puts that plan forward in 1861, in the, a few months into the Civil War. He goes to Delaware and says, hey, here's the plan. But they all say, forget it. We're not interested in abolishing slavery. You, you don't understand, Lincoln. We want our slaves. We don't want a plan to get rid of slavery. But he keeps presenting it to the border states, Kentucky. So Lincoln's evolution, I think, is the evolution of someone who sees the necessity of action against slavery, but moves to different ways of dealing with it. And by the middle, you know, we're here to talk about the Emancipation Proclamation. By the middle of 1862, he's moving toward a completely different way of dealing with slavery, which is as a military measure, military emancipation. That's what the proclamation is. We all saw it out there. It's a military order. It's based on military necessity. But if you put it that way, you don't need the consent of these slave owners anymore. And therefore, all the old policies are irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Gradualism is irrelevant. Monetary compensation is irrelevant. Colonization is irrelevant. This is a new plan. For military reasons, we are going to just declare these slaves free to weaken the other side. So Lincoln, so that's a form of Lincoln's evolution. But the thing that I think is, I, I will stop, is that I think is in a way most impressive to me about Lincoln as someone who was, you know, studying very carefully is Lincoln doesn't start out as the great emancipator in any way. And certainly he shares many of the uh, 
prejudiced views about African Americans of his society. But every step forward, he never goes back. And he thinks about the, the implications. Once you go to emancipation, Lincoln is never willing to go back, even though a lot of people pressure him by 1864, well, maybe this wasn't a good idea, et cetera, et cetera. On the question of the role of blacks in American society, once he abandons colonization, he really has to start thinking about what role African Americans are going to play, and he moves forward on that. He does, and he, he thinks about the logical consequences of the policies he's putting forward. So that's what I see as evolution, mm -hmm. that he's willing to kind of accept the logic of what is happening, and by the end of his life, 1865, he's occupying very, very different positions on race in America, on slavery and its fate, and than he had earlier in his career. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What role did the military play in this in terms of policy? I mean, we know what they did on the ground, but Jim, do you have any, or either one of you, um, any of you, about did, did it help push him along in any kind of way? Were they ahead of the curve, military well, the, leaders? The military is right out there um, on the front lines, uh, not only fighting the war, but also on the front lines of getting rid of slavery. Uh, just take the very first incident that Jim mentioned uh, at Fort Monroe in May of 1861. Uh, Benjamin Butler is the Union commander there. Three slaves come, uh, say that they've been working on Confederate fortifications. A Confederate officer comes and says uh, they belong to so-and-so in Virginia and wants them returned. And Butler says uh, no. He tells them no. Uh, and the next step is for uh, more and more slaves to come into Union lines. Mm -hmm. uh, then Congress passes the first Confiscation Emancipation Act, and that's the War Department that issues the orders to implement that. Orders go out to military commanders not to return uh, fugitive slaves. Uh, and so the military is, uh, is, is right uh, on, on the cusp of this process from the very beginning. Uh, there's an interesting thing, I think, that happens uh, primarily, I would say, during the course of 1862, the second year of the war. Uh, at first, I think, uh, a lot of military commanders, a lot of soldiers, junior officers, um, don't see themselves in any way as emancipators. But the more they see of slavery in the South, the more they realize that slavery that the slaves are really, as Frederick Douglass himself put it on one occasion, the backbone of this rebellion, uh, the, the, stomach. The, the stomach of this rebellion. They are providing the labor that sustains the Confederate economy, the war economy. They're providing the labor that sustains the logistics of the Confederate armies. They begin to say, why should we let them have their slaves? Why should we return their slaves when we know that they're going to be used to, to sustain the war effort, we're trying to win this war. And one way to win the war is to take away the, the slaves, take away the labor power of the slaves, uh, make, bring it over to, to our side. And more and more uh, uh, soldiers are writing home in, say, in 1862 and saying, it's time to take off the kid gloves. It's time to make the traitors feel the weight of this war, and one way to do that is to take their slaves. Mm -hmm. uh, so this penetrates uh, fairly far down in, in the Union Army, and you'll find many examples, uh, even when their officers, like General McClellan, let's say, uh, don't want this to become a war against slavery, uh, when slaves come to Union lines, and uh, even in the border states, a border state like Maryland or Kentucky, and they, the master uh, comes and says, uh, slave, you know, Joe is, is in your army camp and I want him back. Uh, the soldiers won't give him back. They'll, they'll say, you know, get out of here uh, or, or we'll, 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 we'll drive you out of here. So clearly there's a, a role being played at several levels by the army from the top down, mm -hmm. from the commander in chief down, who's President Lincoln, right on down to the uh, common soldier in the ranks mm -hmm. uh, from fairly early in the war. Mm -hmm. Sure, absolutely. Uh, I mean, this, as I the, said, you guys just jump in. This speaks in to, to Eric's point also about uh, an evolution. One of the things that also happens by 1862 is that the soldiers are writing back uh, and saying, time to take the gloves off. But they're also saying, you know, we get down here and, and the only loyal people we're finding, the only people we can trust are the slaves. 
And one of the evolutions in Republican Party thinking, and in, in particular Lincoln's thinking, is the realization that any hope they had that uh, the, the war would spark an uprising among Southern Unionists that would, would throw the rebellion into chaos was gone. And, and part of the reason it was gone, a major part of the reason it was gone, is because soldiers were writing back to homes, to their home families, and, to, and, and commanders in the field were writing back saying, we get down here and there are no loyal whites. There are only, the only loyal people we can trust, the people who are giving us information, about military, crucial military information about what's, where the Confederates are, the only people who welcome us are the slaves. As, and Frederick Douglass said at a certain point, uh, you know, there is no such thing as a disloyal slave. And I think that's also crucial. That also evolves over the course of the war so that uh, I think it, the, the realization that, that the slaves were loyal and they couldn't count on the loyalty, on any loyal uprising in the, uh, uh, in the white population is also critical to the evolution of anti-slavery policy during the war as well. In uh, his first annual message to Congress, the special session of Congress on July 4th, 1861, Lincoln said uh, that there's reason to believe that uh, except for South Carolina, he was willing to grant that South Carolina probably was, a, <laughs> most of the whites there were rebels. But except for South Carolina, uh, it's reasonable to think that uh, a majority of whites really are closet unionists. Uh, and if we appeal to the better angels of their nature uh, and conciliate them, uh, t try to, uh, to bring them back into the union, uh, maybe we can do that. That's in July of 1861. By July of 1862, that's, that's gone. Uh, and as Jim said, from Lincoln on down, it's the slaves who are the unionists in the South. And not, there's, there's no solid core of white unionists in at least the 11 Confederate states. You know, I'm, I'm not really being true to arguments that I've made in print, so I guess I should go ahead and step, stand up for myself. <laughs> I take the... the you know, Jim Oakes was talking about telling the story. He goes back and he finds this and he, and he traces the line back to where it came from. And I, I say that people only lived history in one direction. Uh, and I emphasize, I don't let my students use the word antebellum. Right. Said, it's always antebellum. We just don't know when the next war is going to be. And, and we, don't, we don't organize our, our lives around a war we don't know is coming, and neither did they. Um, and so, you know, I've sort of... Uh, Jost a little bit with Jim McPherson, too, about this and pointing out that um, all the things that you just said are true. We just built this big project at Richmond, visualizing emancipation, where we show everywhere the Union Army is and every instance we can find of the African Americans interacting with the Union Army. And you'll find all the way 1865 episodes of being betrayed, of being uh, of rape, of, you know, of uh, being abandoned. Um, and I think that. We, the, the two stories we want to have, one is the evolution of America. It sort of wakes up and becomes better, and we want everybody to be Abraham Lincoln. Um, but I, I point out that in 1864, Lincoln got the same percentage of the vote he'd gotten in 1860, which means 45% of white northern men, including the United States Army, vote against Abraham Lincoln in 1864. And which is amazing. <laughs> after Gary Wills supposedly has Lincoln transforming the war of the Gettysburg Address, and after Gettysburg itself, and after the fall of Atlanta, and after Shenandoah Valley, and after Lincoln has shown himself to be the great leader he is, people still, nearly half of white northern population, won't support Abraham Lincoln. So I guess, you know, it strikes me as necessary to look at the whole universe. If you look at the Republican Party and its policy and its leaders, I think Jim's exactly right. If you pull the camera back and see who all was on board with this, uh, the white north, uh, and I think this is one thing the movie <laughs> does a pretty good job of, of showing the Democrats who were just apoplectic about that Lincoln's right. going to win all of this. Right. And I don't think Reconstruction is actually understandable to you understand that 45% of white northerners are not with the program at the beginning. So there's you know the, you asked me before, Annette, about what, why. What's, what's gained and lost from the different historical perspectives today? I think that if the danger of seeing this as the unfolding of a, a vision, a plan, a policy, is that we forget how opposed it was, how risky it was, how 
uh, unlikely even, I mean, I think the election of 1864 is the turning point in the war. Even after that, important things can happen. So there's no, you, nobody can do it all in one frame. Mm -hmm. And Jim has, has brilliantly put down the frame of what drove the people who won and brought this about, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, another frame would be, well, let's look at the northern population as a whole and see what they do. And then, as Jim McPherson was just saying, look at the, the southern population. The fact that only 1,000 white men in present-day Virginia voted, uh, fought for the Union after so many had voted for the Constitutional Union Party before. I'm struck by the constant change and mm -hmm. that people are, are constantly redefining loyalties in very uh, remarkable ways. So I just wanted to mm -hmm. stimulate things. But you but could add, you, you could turn what you just said around and say, isn't it remarkable that after the incredible casualties of 1864, you know, the terrible, terrible loss of life that yep. Grant and his army sustained, yep. and, um, you know, that, that Lincoln still carried every single northern state except New Jersey, perhaps. That's right. They're well, always on the... Uh, see, that's where I differ from you New, guys. New you guys look at the Electoral College. No, I know that they, he didn't carry it by a giant majority no, no, in no. the state. But, but still, he, the people, that a majority was still willing to, to continue the war under those circumstances is, you could say, is actually remarkable. <laughs> that, uh, after all, McClellan was offering a policy of peace but with union, he was not saying, hey, let's just give in to the rebels, but we're going to have, you know, it's sort of like when Nixon ran, I have a peace plan. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I have a plan for peace. <laughs> um, so, you know. But it'll be with honor. Right, Whatever. exactly. So, you know, you can look at it both ways. I'm yeah. not saying you're wrong at all. The North well, that's, was that's deeply. That's a good place to start. The point, the point you're making is quite uh, important, right. The North was deeply divided. It was not a united North, and there were even some. Unionists in the South, as you know, in your hometown. Right. But um, he, he's from East Tennessee, a place that did have a lot of uh, Southerners. I was Lincoln's best hope. <laughs> right, supporting, <laughs> supporting, the, uh, supporting the Union. Um, but yeah. yeah and, and my point is, if mm. you're trying to explain what happens following the line through that, that, that you folks do is right. If you're trying to understand what the universe was like, um, I think that it's easy along the way to sort of be on the side that wins, and, you, and these other, this opposition and these reservations are sloughed away. And so that would just be, you know, everything that I've done is to uh, try to account for all the variance as well as for the line that goes through it, the entire range of, of ideology that's contesting. And I, ironically, I think, go back to your very first question, that it's when people see us not fully accounting for the anomalies, reservations, resistance, and all this that makes them skeptical when we seem to be just making a case for what ultimately triumphed. So I, I don't let my students use jargon either, but I do use teleological, which is you start at the end of the story and go back and find the beginning, mm -hmm. and everything drives toward that. It strikes me in the Civil War in particular, we need to resist that at every turn. And because, uh, so that's just my own take on it. That <laughs> but we do have to explain what happened. <laughs> Some things happened and some things didn't yep. happen. It's true that, at, and historians all know this, at every moment there are many options out there and many possibilities, and nothing is ever inevitable, absolutely. On the other hand, the job of the historian is to explain what, what did happen, and since emancipation did happen and Lincoln was reelected, et cetera, we have to provide a story which plausibly explains that while, yes, taking into account that there were other options on the table for people. Yeah, I, I just think that people find American history less interesting than it could be because we suppress all the alternative histories along the way. I actually disagree with all three of my friends here, so I, I, why am I keep doing this? Because I feel like I, this is my job uh, up here to be the, the, the representative of, of that kind of perspective. So I hope everybody has a question answer period. We'll, We'll be gentle with me. I don't think it is a question necessarily of one view being teleological and the other not being, because I think actually there are a lot of different ways which I actually f tried very hard to frame my book as an anti-teleological book, to say that nobody knew uh, un until the very end what the outcome was right. going to be. Uh, 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 and I did put an awful lot of Democrats into my story to show exactly what the Republicans were up against. But one of the things that has always struck me, this goes to the second question you asked about why didn't we know. One of the things I think 
that the problem with the way we've talked about emancipation so far is to, that it's too teleological in the sense that what the, teleolo the teleology we're looking for is the disastrous situation in the post-war South. And we're trying to explain the failure of somehow we're trying to, the, the failure of things to turn out as we would have liked back onto something about the way emancipation happened to begin with. And I think that's really a much more serious problem in the scholarship, that kind of teleology, than the one that says it was, I don't think anybody think. well, that's not true. There are people who say, you know, as I said, there are Lincoln scholars who say Lincoln knew from the time he was 10 that he was going to free the slaves. And there are people who have said things like, you know, uh, uh, by the time Lincoln got around to issuing the proclamation, no force on earth could have stopped the revolution from happening. Social historians make teleological arguments. Lincoln scholars make teleological arguments. But the dominant teleology in the literature has been the, the pull of the failure of Reconstruction back into the war right. to explain how it happened. And that's one of the things I'm actually trying to resist in, in, right. in my book. Back to the proclamation. Um, what difference does it make? All of you tell me, what, what was its critical importance? We, you were talking before about the fact that people, yeah, were, all, yeah. people were already leaving. Slaves were running away. Yeah. Um, right. Right. There was a sense that not inevitable, but the process and things have been breaking down before then. What was critical about the proclamation? Just, you know, well, and, and this the, is for all of you. What the, do you think is important? It's the critical turning point. It's the point at which uh, it, it implements a policy that I think the Republicans had actually decided upon the previous summer uh, to basically expend emancipation to the entire Confederacy. So it makes emancipation universal. Mm -hmm. And it and it does, and it attempts to implement that by changing the policy on the ground in two important ways. The first one we all know about is Lincoln opens the army to the armed forces of uh, African Americans based on the Militia Act that had previously been passed that allowed him to do that. And, and, and second, it uh, lifts the ban on enticement that had been in place since the beginning of the war. That is, they began emancipating slaves on August 8th, 1861, but they banned Union soldiers from going on to plantations and farms in the South and encouraging slaves to leave. The proclamation lifts that ban, and that from that point on, you see Union officers and Union soldiers going on to plantations saying, look, you're free, you know, Lincoln has freed you by this emancipation, come and join the Union Army, and from that point on, you see uh, the, the slaves had always been running to Union lines right from the start of the war, but from that point on you start to see in 63 truly enormous numbers of slaves following the Union Army and running to the Union Army with the, uh, you know, because the, the, the active policy from the emancipation forward is to, proclamation forward, is to, is to encourage this. I don't think you can sell short the immense symbolic value and power of the Emancipation Proclamation. It got enormous. Uh, exposure in the public media of the time, not only in the United States, but abroad. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the one single document that stands out. It's part of a process, yes. The process has been going on uh, before the Emancipation Proclamation, and it continued after the Emancipation Proclamation, but it, it's, it's like a, a kind of EKG, suddenly that's <laughs> up there. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has this enormous visibility uh, and and uh, it, it's, the word of it circulates by the slate grapevine through the South. And I think it uh, encourages even more slaves to, to run away to Union lines. But it's also an announcement uh, that the war now has uh, another purpose as well as just res restoring the old Union. It's no, it's no longer the old Union. The, as Lincoln said later at Gettysburg, uh, we're giving this union a new birth of freedom, and the one thing that stands out as symbolic of that new birth of freedom in 1863 is the Emancipation Proclamation. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. I also think it, it, it. I also think it accustoms because it's universal, because it it makes emancipation universal throughout the the seceded states. Uh, it accustoms so. northern so. voters to the idea that the war is not going to end without slavery having been thoroughly abolished. And the fact that that turned out not to be the case was crucial because I think it created the political will by which a 13th Amendment becomes possible mm -hmm. and, and conceivable in 1864 and 5 in a way that it was inconceivable in 1861 and 62.
Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I think the proclamation, which uh, we, many of you here had the opportunity to see it a little while ago, uh, it's a little hard to read, and <laughs> it, it's kind of faded right now, but uh, everybody can easily find out what it says. But it, what, what, what strikes me as interesting in the proclamation is not simply what you just heard, but that Lincoln addresses a little paragraph in it to slaves themselves. In other words, he's dealing with them and now as people who the Union must win their loyalty. He says, first of all, that they have a right to defend their freedom by violence if necessary. Now, he says, I, I urge you not to, not to use violence except in necessary self-defense. Many people thought if you declare emancipation, slaves are going to rise up and cut the throats of their masters. There'll be a you know, giant race war in the South. Lincoln could easily have said, just take it easy and don't do anything. But he said, no, you have the right to defend your freedom, even by violence if necessary. And secondly, he says, I urge you to go to work for reasonable wages. I, I, always, I mean, this is probably the least important part. But I always find that word reasonable interesting. <laughs> Why did he put reasonable, not just go to work for wages, go to work for reasonable wages, which weren't always available to people. That's you know, partly the free labor idea from before the Civil War, that people have a right to you know, negotiate for their wages, to choose their employer. But to tell you that to slaves is a rather interesting thing in the middle of a proclamation of emancipation. So um, it, it's well worth reading very carefully. One of the things about Lincoln is he was a master of the language, and he chose his words with extreme care. So you have to read Lincoln really carefully to get the full depth of what he's saying at any particular moment. I think what the Emancipation Proclamation does is uh, say, okay, the war will now be prosecuted till its very end. Okay, that that it, it redefines the purpose as well as the way the war is fought. Um, that White South recognizes now there really is no turning back. We lose this, we've lost mm -hmm. slavery and everything else. So I think it really is a, a pivot around mm -hmm. which the war mm -hmm. turns. And overseas, does it have any effect? Any foreign policy implications? It certainly did have an effect overseas. Um, in the month after January 1st, 50 public meetings were held around the UK. Uh, thousands of people attended these meetings and um, praised the Lincoln administration, praised the United States uh, for the Emancipation Proclamation. It, it ended, I think, um, for, for definitively any possibility of British intervention on the behalf of the Confederacy, which had been uh, a potential problem, mm -hmm. uh, poten potential danger to the Union cause right, right up until, I think, the Emancipation Proclamation and, and after it. Uh, it precluded uh, the possibility of European intervention, which had been a live option up until that time. Yeah. Anything else you would like to say about your book before we turn it over to the audience for questions? Buy it. Buy it? <laughs> can I, uh, Annette, no, no, can I say, can I say something about his book? Absolutely, yes. I just want to say one word about Jim's book as his publicity agent. Um, one of the things I think is very good and important about that book is that it urges us to get away from the dichotomy that people often put, is the war about the Union or is the war about slavery? And I think, you know, it's, he shows that both issues were in the minds of the Republicans from the very beginning. It's, the balance shifts, but it's not as if for two years they're only interested in the Union and then suddenly they become interested in slavery. From the very beginning of the war, people were trying to save a union in which slavery would be on the way out in some way. But how exactly did it? So I, I commend him for trying to get us away from that either or situation, which is so common in discussions of the Civil War. So do you expect opposition? Did you expect opposition <laughs> from the, for this? Well, he had any heirs here, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> do I? If that's the worst you got, yes. you're in good shape. <laughs> <laughs> I've been telling my friends for two years, I call, uh, that I, I call it on the, on the email line, you know, the subject line, I say, the book nobody will believe. You know? The book nobody will believe. I'm not even talking mainly about historians, but I mean the public. I mean, this is a book for the general public as well. You're speaking to yeah. 
to everyone. Uh, what I, I really don't know. I mean, I can, I can imagine pushback, but I can also imagine at this particular moment in time when I think some of the cynicism about politics has diminished a little bit. I think, I, 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 I just don't know. You know, I just can't tell. Okay, well, you know? we'll find out. We'll find. We'll find. <laughs> thank you. Thank I expect you very some much. pushback. Well, I, you I want mean, some I, pushback, right? Of course. <laughs> oh, I want universal adulation. Universal. Okay, well, well, if people have questions, well, you know the drill. This is being recorded, so we need to hear what you're asking. So I think I will start over here. Uh, good evening. Uh, gentlemen, my question is actually about the, the prelude. That I was ex interested in uh, the evolution of thought of, of Lincoln and the Republicans. But particularly, I wanted you to turn your attention to the conflict that happened in Kansas, along the Kansas border area, because that was one of the changes that presaged the change of the Republican Party, the decision to leave behind the compromise and instead allow states to vote uh, whether or not to be free states. And I'm wondering what impact you think that had on the sort of march to war and, and the evolution of the National Party's stances. Well, I'll make a stab at that. The uh, Kansas controversy really gave birth to the Republican Party. Jim's book is about the Republican Party and its um, success in bringing an end to the slavery. And that's uh, when the Republican Party was born, in opposition to the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Um, so that's not where the story starts, but that's a major punctuation point in the story. Come this side. Yes, I have a question for uh, Professor Oakes about, uh, in particular, just the way the Union commanders during the war interpreted, like the, the first uh, Confiscation Act, and then, of course, subsequently there were military orders. But how did they, what was the role of these commanders in terms of what, what happened with uh, fugitive slaves and that sort of thing uh, in, the, in the Civil War? And how did they even feel about you know, emancipation, so to speak? Well, I think the, the Union Army is. Yeah. Like the North, it's, it's, it's divided. The North is divided over this, and the Union Army is divided over this. There are anti-slavery generals and soldiers, and there are pro-slavery generals and soldiers. There's a general, uh, uh, there's a general resistance on the part of soldiers who were Democrats to making this war an anti-slavery war. But that said, I think uh, there's also in the Army more. This this has surprised me uh, more than I realized. Uh, a commitment to the idea of civilian rule, and that if if Congress passes this law, and if, if the, the War Department issues these orders, we have to obey these orders, right? And, and there's not too much resistance in the Confederate states, in the seceded states. The problem is in the border states, because that's a mess, because those states don't leave the Union. The state laws presumably are still in existence, and yet there are policies that are being enunciated from Washington that say contradictory things. And so most of the... Most of the conflict we see within the Union Army about the implementation, about, about the way the Union Army treats, happens in the border states. It's in Maryland, it's in Kentucky, it's in Missouri. Those are the, the generals in those states are the ones that we see most often in the literature when we talk about these kinds of things. It's relatively clear cut early on in that military emancipation is legitimate in the disloyal states. It's in the border states that you get a lot of tension, especially within the Army. Uh, given uh, President Lincoln's skill in working with Congress, and given the difficulties that his successor, uh, Andrew Johnson, had in working with Congress, what do you think are the odds of the 14th Amendment's enactment if President Lincoln had not uh, been killed? That's Eric. Uh, well, uh, that's, um, that's what we call counterfactual history, which is uh, fine. Um, you, can't, you can't be wrong. That's it. You can't, you can't prove wrong. I'm wrong. So, you know, it, it, it's inconceivable that Lincoln would have gotten himself into the fix that Andrew Johnson did. Lincoln was far too connected to the mainstream of the Republican Party, far too good a politician, far too connected with northern public opinion. It's impossible, I think, to imagine Lincoln becoming so alienated from Congress the way uh, Johnson uh, ended up and being impeached by Congress. I, I actually think it's quite likely that had Lincoln lived, Lincoln and Congress would have worked out some plan of reconstruction as during the Civil War they worked out things. You know, Lincoln, 
they had debates, Lincoln and Congress, but Lincoln signed every single bill that passed through Congress relating to slavery, with the exception of the Wade Davis bill, which is more about Reconstruction. Um, Lincoln and Congress would worked out a deal on Reconstruction. I think it would have probably looked very much like the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which was a mainstream Republican measure trying to guarantee the rights of free labor for former slaves, and something probably like the 14th Amendment. Now, would they have gone further than that to radical Reconstruction? Maybe not under Lincoln, because the dynamic that pushed them toward radical Reconstruction was the impasse with Johnson, and you wouldn't have had that impasse if Lincoln. Mm -hmm. But the further you get into the history, the more just total speculation it becomes. But I think you would have probably seen something like the 14th Amendment if Lincoln had lived, but it would have had the cooperation of the president, not the total opposition the way it did with Andrew Johnson. Mm -hmm. Hi, my question is for uh, Mr. Oakes. I'm not a professional historian, but I'm a member of the public who doesn't buy your argument yet either, so here we go. <laughs> Uh, my multi-part question, I'll make yes. it brief. Is your thesis that from the outset of the Republican Party it was uh, bent on abolishing slavery? And if so, aren't you then required to tell us which Republicans were and at what times the Charles Sumners, who are more liberal compared to the moderate and conservative Republicans who did not want to end slavery in the South, and also, a quick note about Frederick Douglass changing his position about the Constitution. Wasn't that Garrett Smith patronizing his new newspaper and became, he changed his position? Because didn't he hold the Garrisonian view before that about the Constitution? So he that's did. my three-part question. I'll let you part three first. He was certainly influenced by Garrett Smith. That's no question. I, don't, I, don't, uh, I resist the suggestion that some biographers have made that he changed his mind because Garrett Smith paid him $200. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Link, it's just, Frederick Douglass wasn't that kind of person. Um, uh, let me go backwards. What was the second? Uh, the second point? one, um, if, you, if I, your I thesis that is that the Republican Party was against uh, for abolishing party, slavery it, from the, the start. Republican, the Republican Party is an anti-slavery party. When I say, you have to be careful. I, what the Republican Party was committed to was putting slavery on a course of ultimate extinction. What does that mean? It means the kind of thing that, that, that Eric was talking about before. It doesn't mean they're going to go. Nobody believes the federal government has the power to go into a state and abolish slavery. So that's not what it means. Right? It, it means and it means a, a series of policies, some of which all Republicans accepted no slavery in the territories. Virtually all Republicans accepted the abolition of slavery in Washington, DC. Virtually all Republicans wanted to revise, if not repeal, the Fugitive Slave Act of 18. 50. Not all of them believed the federal government had the power or, the, or any business, for example, abolishing slavery on forts and military installations in the seceded states, in the southern states, but there was talk about that among some uh, Republicans. But the general framework that I'm talking about, it's in the 1856 and 1860 Republican Party platforms. Freedom is the normal, natural condition that exists under the Constitution, and only in the states where slavery Creates with the states create a law, does slavery exist constitutionally? So the, the commitment to freedom national is the general overarching policy of the entire party. Why Thank are you, you skeptical? Um, just based on reading books by Eric Foner and James McPherson. <laughs> no, I, I don't. I think you misinterpreted my book. <laughs> I thought we agreed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, back over here. I have a two-part question. Uh, the first is, I, um, while I appreciated your responses uh, to Dr. Reed uh, regarding the effect of the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, they all spoke to the effect of the Emancipation Proclamation on the war. But what about the effect of the Emancipation Proclamation on the people they, it freed? Um, and the spirit that it brought to the people who knew the words that said, forever free, and who began to leave plantations, and sat in darkened rooms on the night of December 31st, 
1862 and waited until midnight when the Emancipation Proclamation would take effect. It may not have meant for sure that they were emancipated, but certainly the spiritual shackles came off. And the physical shackles and the legal shackles were never going to be on the same way again. That's my statement. Anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Let me just uh, quickly respond to that with a, a story that I think backs it up. Okay. Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who was in South Carolina, was a famous New England abolitionist, and he had went to South Carolina to become the colonel of the first black regiment uh, recruited in, in the Confederate States. It was called the first South Carolina. And he talks about a celebration in Beaufort, South Carolina, on the South Carolina Sea Islands, among the thousands of former slaves who had been liberated there by the Union occupation early in the war. And during the course of all the speeches and so on, uh, Higginson is observing this. And during a break in this, a quavery woman's voice starts singing, my country tis of thee. It's a black woman. For the first time, as Higginson puts it, she had a country. Mm -hmm. uh, that was what the Emancipation Proclamation meant to her and to the thousands of other former slaves who were in the audience there on January 1st, 1863 in South Carolina. Thank you. Can I just add something? I'm going to take the Ed Ayers approach here, <laughs> which is that there are many different stories here, and we should not what Jim just said is completely right, of course, in an area where the Union Army was occupying the Sea Islands. There are many parts of the Confederacy where the Union Army didn't get until the very end of the war, and indeed, Annette was talking before about Texas, they didn't get there at all during the war. That's mm -hmm. why Juneteenth, it mm -hmm. wasn't until June after the war was over that right. the Union commander came into Texas and announced slavery is over because there hadn't been a single battle or anything in Texas. So there are many parts of the Confederacy where slaves get to know about the Emancipation Proclamation, but it doesn't actually have a practical effect on them until toward the very end of the war. In fact, when Lincoln calls in Frederick Douglass in August 1864 to talk to, he says, you know, I'm disappointed that not more slaves are running off. I want you to figure out a way to go into the South and spread word of the Emancipation Proclamation and encourage slaves to run to Union lines. So in some areas, the proclamation was sort of immediate and people felt this spiritual liberation that you're referring to. In others, it took, it took a longer time. In other words, emancipation is a process. It did right. not just happen on January 1st, 1863. Not only political emancipation, but even the personal emancipation of people feeling that they were free. And it's, there are millions of enslaved people who are never within reach of the Union Army. Right, right. Never. Right. So I think that it's how we combine all these into the same braided story that I think that it's true. Right, and some would argue that it's still happening. But, but I still have another question. <laughs> Quick. All right. <laughs> Am I uh, naive in thinking that unless you are taking the moral measure of the man, meaning Abraham Lincoln, um, should we care what his motivations were in um, freeing the slaves or moving on the 13th Amendment? As historians, we should care. We, we try to story. figure out everything. It's not everything, but it's <laughs> not. <laughs> I mean, but, 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 but yes, I mean, if, if we want to look at him as a, as, as a, mor at a moral question, but as a political question, is it important to second guess the result? I would say in the spirit of your first statement, if you turn the, the telescope around, yeah. the question is if you're becoming free, he can believe whatever he wants to. Just right. give him the chance. Right. I take your point. Right. Right. Yes, I have two questions for Dr. Ayers and McPherson. Um, there was a gentleman, Francis Liber, who basically established the treatise on uh, the conduct of armies during um, uh, time of war. Uh, 
And I understand that was a direct result of the Emancipation Proclamation because uh, Lincoln was concerned about potential uprising, slave uprisings in the South and, and potential bloodbath. And basically the South had already indicated that they were going to uh, enslave black soldiers. So I think that um, uh, based on what I've been reading, that Liber um, document or treatise was a direct result of the Emancipation Proclamation. I'd like to get your thoughts on it. The other question I have just quickly is exactly, there were 200,000 blacks that served in the Civil War. Approximately how many blacks were actually were battle casualties as opposed to blacks that were killed, I mean died as a result of um, disease or illnesses? Just want to get your thoughts on that. I can answer the second question and then I'll <laughs> yield somebody else on the first part of it. Of those 200,000, uh, 37,000 died in the war which is a slightly higher percentage than white soldiers. Uh, but the reason for that was primarily disease mortality, which was much higher among black soldiers than it was among white soldiers. Uh, nearly for 34,000 of the 37,000 uh, uh, black soldiers who died, died of disease. So it was a, a 10 to 1 ratio, whereas among white soldiers it was about a 2 to 1 ratio. And there's a, there's a new book ab about uh, Francis Lieber, that, uh, uh, Lincoln's Code, um, that says that, um, and it's interesting, uh, he admires it, but he also says that it's a sort of a, that winning nations uh, want to codify the rules of war. Um, and that, I don't know it's a direct result, but they were linked together, that Lincoln was looking for a larger rationale by which this policy made sense in the eyes of international law and uh, was consistent. And so uh, Lieber is making sure uh, as much as possible that uh, the, uh, the, the great fear is Haiti and, and that, that there's going to be this slave rebellion and all this. Lieber is trying to uh, codify as much as, as much as possible what Jim Oakes is showing the Army doing and to, and to give it a rationale, a logic, and it endures much to this day. It's interesting, the book points out that much is about code, is actually about slavery. And that's kind of fallen away as people are using it for international law today. So that, that's my own limited understanding of it, that you're right, those things, two things are woven tightly together. Well, the oh, code so had, to, had to do with a lot of other things as well, and, yeah. including uh, how to treat guerrillas and guerrilla warfare, right. uh, war. with the behavior of occupation troops in, in um, in their relationship with civilians. So it's, it, it's not just slavery. No, that's it's, what's it's, it's endured. It's very comprehensive. All, all yeah. of that part yeah. has endured. Yeah. Right. Uh, I had a question for, um, <clears throat> uh, for James McPherson. I, I read in your book, uh, The Battle Cry of Freedom, um, something interesting about at the start of the war, very early on, how really both sides didn't believe, or really believed that the war wouldn't last very long. That's, um, I mean, the rebels and the Yankees, uh, going into it, even before Sumter, uh, after things broke out, that it would be a relatively short skirmish and that, uh, you know, they were going to squash each other relatively quickly. And, of course, as things endured, starting with Bull Run and into uh, uh, Shenandoah and especially with, um, with Antietam, as, the, as the, the war dragged on, I mean, at the risk of sounding too uh, te teleological, I guess, uh, um, was there evidence to suggest that perhaps the Emancipation Proclamation uh, was issued by uh, Abraham Lincoln as perhaps a bold measure to, to really speed up the war by way of total war, as a, as a real massive uh, head rush towards total war, and that uh, this perhaps could be a, a real reason for, his, um, for this issue, speaking you know, beyond the spheres of making it more about uh, slavery and, and, and freeing the slaves. Could it be um, really more about that subject as well? Well, Lincoln himself said that this was a measure, a military measure, uh, to, to help win the war. Um, you're quite right to suggest that it's, it's part, and it's also part of the process of the war becoming what historians now call hard war. Um, the, the, the idea that um, the war would be over in just a few months that both sides shared back in 1861 had go long gone now. And clearly this was a major uh, a, a, a military necessity was the phrase that was used, uh, widespread phrase used to justify the Emancipation Proclamation, a military necessity to help us win the war. Uh, 
by weakening the Confederacy. Yes, it was certainly part of that process. Even, I mean, <clears throat> any anticipation of greater bloodshed, too, for, for that matter, and uh, I mean, in some of the skirmishes that followed. Well, nobody in January 1st, 1863, could know whether the war was going to go on for another um, 28 months, as it did, uh, or even longer or less. But clearly, it had already gone on for almost two years. And one of the, I think you're quite right to suggest that one of the hopes was that it would help the North to win the war uh, sooner than, than uh, but uh, what, uh, the reaction among a lot of Northern people, as well as most uh, Southern whites, was that this would prolong the war by making the Southern people fight even harder, because now there was much more at stake for them uh, if they lose the war than there, than there might have been uh, before emancipation became the professed uh, um, uh, policy. Uh, with the Emancipation Proclamation. So th th there were both reactions. One, that it might speed up the war and bring the war to an end sooner. Another, that it might prolong the war and make it even more bloody. I think <clears throat> the, the book that Ed mentioned by John Witt on Lincoln's Code speaks directly to the question you're asking. I mean, one of the points I think uh, that book is making is that uh, uh, in order to find, to embed emancipation, in the laws of war and to justify it, uh, Lieber and the Lincoln administration had to expand the powers of the Union Army in its attack on civilians. I mean, you can't, you're, you're not, you, you have to broaden the definition of military necessity to include going onto plantations and taking what the Southerners viewed as their property away from them, but it's an it's attack on non military. You know, homes and farms in the South, and the the, own, the paradox for wit is that to get emancipation legalized, you had to expand the parameters of war in ways that may we may not like. And there's another indirect result: the Emancipation Proclamation calling for the enlistment of African American soldiers stops the Confederacy from exchanging prisoners, and so you would have seen a. a you know, in the hard war, you would have seen a sort of a skyrocketing of death in Andersonville and Elmira because of the lack of exchange directly as a result of that policy. Thank you. Um, because we've got so many historians on the same stage, I have kind of a, a bigger picture question. So if possible, I'd like to hear from each of you. Um, in the course of doing your research and writing your books, not only about what we're talking about here, but things that preceded that, things that happen now, things that might happen in the future, is there kind of a North Star that you guys keep coming back to when it comes to the way events unfold, um, no matter how basic it might be? But as historians, do you, do you see something that keeps coming up over and over again? You mean specifically about the war or just as a just general, in general just philosophical? In general. Anything about people or leadership or the way events just happen? Kind of a broad question, I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll go first. And uh, I kind of uh, articulate a little bit that the idea that I have in my book about the Civil War is deep contingency, in which there are people's entire identity pivoted. Certainly, I'm thinking of the White South and the example I was using before about people who had voted for the Whigs and then for the Constitutional Union Party and then become and then die for the Confederacy. And the example I used for that, they bring God along with them. They decide that God has become a confederate, right? And so that you can see at various points in history, not all that often, where these things will shift. Maybe 9-11 will prove to be that in a while, in which the view of the world by an event sort of cascading through the social order has a consequences that people are not anticipating at the outset. So I think that history for me is a series of punctuations and, and like throwing a rock into a pedal, and then it radiates out from that rather than a flowing stream. So that's my theory. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a bunch of historians on the stage here, he began by saying. Well, I, uh, uh, for me, it's always, it's an ancient problem, the, you know, free will and determinism. It's structure and contingency. You're always, as a historian, balancing those things that seem driven by irresistible forces against the fact that anything can happen. 
right? And, and it's never easy to, there is no answer in every, every particular situation you're describing right. at any point along the way is driven by both of these forces or facts, you know, the accidents happen and they, the, the, when they happen, they don't come out in completely unpredictable ways. That's right, that's the deep part. You know? It's not just anything can happen, they work with, within existing structures and ideologies. So the, 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 a good example is the, the point we've been referring to, we've referred to a couple of times. When Benjamin Butler decides not to send those slaves back to the Union, uh, to their owner in May of 1861, he's, in one sense, he's playing it by ear. Nobody's done this. There has been no policy. On the other hand, he's not flailing about blindly. The arguments he's beginning to make about why he shouldn't send them back would be familiar to anybody who had been involved in the anti-slavery movement for the previous decades. And so, the language so, of law. Yeah, so nobody could have predicted that these, this would happen at this time and in this place, that these three slaves run to union lines and force a decision. But the decision they force isn't just a blind accident. Right? So it's always structure and contingency, free will and determinism, and that's something I think all historians have to deal with all the time. You know? And resist too much teleology, but don't pretend that in the end we do have to explain what happened. Yep. Okay. Uh, good evening. I've enjoyed all of your work, but I especially wanted to uh, ask uh, Professor Foner about a couple of things. You know, the golden age of the Emancipation Proclamation, it seems to me, was between 1865 and 1876, when Reconstruction came. It wasn't completely implemented in 1865, as you all have pointed out, but, but by 1876, we knew that the deal was not going down. In other words, they had, there was a complete reversion. Now, um, and those parts of the Emancipation Proclamation that you lifted up, I think, are not often lifted up, but are very important the notion of a decent wage, and the notion of a right to defend. But you know, there are some people in the South who still do not believe that they lost the Civil War, and still do not believe that the Emancipation Proclamation means anything. Thus, you got in 1898, the uprising, this was white people uprising, not black folks, the uprising because someone dared print a newspaper, a whole area of a town was burned out. Or you get the 1921 uh, burning of Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So there, we know that there was significant resistance in the South and that the Reconstruction basically gave people permission to go back to a kind of quasi-slavery. So I'm like some of the others asking you to do a little spec speculation. What kind of political configuration would have allowed the Emancipation Proclamation to be implemented? Furthermore, what kind of political configuration would have distributed the 40 acres and a mule that was promised through the Freedmen's Bureau Third, what kind of political configuration would have allowed the Freedmen's Bureau to be effective? Now, I know I'm asking you to speculate, but one of my favorite writers, Stephen Carter, wrote a book very recently, The Assassination of Abraham Lincoln, that presumes, uh, no, the impeachment of Abraham Lincoln, forgive me, but presumes that Lincoln lived longer than uh, when he died, not too much longer, but lived longer than when he died and talked about what might have happened, but only for a year or so out. So I'm asking you to take it from 1876 to as far as you want to, to share what kind of political configuration could have made this thing work so much better that we wouldn't still be grappling with these issues today. Well, you know, this is awfully complicated. Uh, and you have to do it very quickly, because we've got yeah, to move uh, You know, <laughs> you, what you're really asking is, was there any possibility of Reconstruction being successful or more successful than it was. If, if Reconstruction had been successful, if the political, basic civil political rights of African Americans had, had stuck, so, so to speak, in the South, uh, that were implemented and then taken away later on, uh, then many of the things you took, you wouldn't have had utopia, you wouldn't have nirvana, but you would have had a much more democratic and you know, modern sort of society in, in, in the South in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. We are, we are oppressed by the tyranny of the fact, you know? We, it's, it, we know that Reconstruction failed, and it's very hard to kind of figure out alternative scenarios. If the Republican Party had maintained its commitment that it did have at the very end of the Civil War, its willingness to enforce the law of the land, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, the civil rights laws, then um, maybe this could have happened. You know, it, it's almost impossible to say um, but I, I don't think we should just throw up our hands and say, 
no, it was absolutely inevitable that the, the prom, you know, it's, it's 50 years since Martin Luther King stood up at the Lincoln Memorial and said, we've come to cash the promissory note of the Emancipation Proclamation. That's a century later from the Emancipation Proclamation. I don't think it was inevitable that it would take another century for freedom to really be, you know, uh, implemented for many people. But uh, it's very hard to kind of work out a speculative scenario which would sort of get you from Reconstruction to a much a more democratic and you know uh, a, a progressive kind of situation in the South then actually happened. So that's that's about all I can say. <laughs> got to thinking something about something Mr. Foner said. You made the point that in spite of all the casualties and what was going on, the Republicans won in 1864. Nixon won. I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, well, you know, but that's it. But Lincoln won. But um, it struck me that not only did the Republicans win that election, but they dominated presidential politics for a couple of generations after the Civil War. And that is a real contrast from more recent wars, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, the opposition party won a presidential election, almost the next chance they had. Iraq is particularly striking because the casualties in that were minuscule compared to the Civil War, and yet the Republicans lost an election. Now that, to me, indicates that people on both sides of the Civil War thought they were fighting about something much more important, and the Americans, because of the Civil War, may have a less tolerance for war than they did during that time. I was wondering what you thought of that. Well, I'm not so, I don't want to make a, a general rule about wars and elections. I think the, it is an important fact that the Civil War fixed the political structure of the United States for two or three generations, really up to the New Deal. Um, you look at the maps, the, the Republicans always won the North almost entirely after Reconstruction. The South was solidly Democratic for a long, long, long time. And even if you look at the map of the last election, you can see the Civil War imprinted on that map. The parties have kind of switched, so to speak, but the South voted completely differently from most of the rest of the country. And we, you know, whether for, their, for whatever reasons, but um, the Civil War is imprinted in our politics still today, which suggests, as you said, that it had a tremendous impact on the way different regions of the country uh, think of themselves. And this, goes, this helps explain the last question, too. Samuel J. Tilden did get more popular votes, probably, than Rutherford B. Hayes in 1876, okay? From them, for the next four decades, the closest elections in American history yeah. are imprinted of the Civil War, but they're so close right. that things could have turned out differently. So I think that, you know, what Eric is saying is exactly right. I mean, I'm a historian of the South, and so I've studied all these race riots and the lynchings and segregation and all this, and it's so discouraging to see that without the power of the federal government, it's hard to see how the white South was ever going to change. And they had half the power, you know, in the, and everything was pivoting on that. So even FDR has to kowtow to the white South to do that. So as we think about the, the generations that follow and this, the century of segregation that followed, it's the, what, what Eric is saying, it's the very precariously balanced structures of power but white Southerners run the South, and until they can't, uh, that stays in place. Well, we'll have to leave it with that. Uh, thank everyone for coming. I'd like to thank the panelists. <laughs>